Christ. Trust and receive. Kind of let those percolate in your mind for a little bit. If you would join me in prayer. Loving Father, God, we thank you for the blessing of life. And God, the, the joy that we can have in relationships and sharing experiences. And God, for that relationship we have with you. And I ask that you would this day, this time, for this message is yours, that you would speak your words to each one of us, that we could hear and internalize what you have for each one. God, we thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Trust and receive. Both of those can present challenges in our life, if we think about it, at different times we kind of maybe struggle with trust or it's hard to receive sometimes when someone gives you something. It's a difficult situation in, for a lot of people. We start out today's message with two sections of Scripture that don't seem like they go together. We begin with how do we relate to Jesus Have you ever really thought about that? I mean, we know how we relate maybe with a family member, your spouse or brother, sister. Uh, Maybe you have a favorite aunt or an uncle. And you have really interesting memories, and you can relate to them. In a lot of cases, through the world of, of movement and jobs, we may not be as close to a family member or a friend. When we get together, maybe years later, it's, it's just, you just flow. It just, you just pick up right up where you left off because you were so close that you can relate and trust. And, and just that memory is there. But we can't relate to Jesus in the same way we relate to anyone else. And that'll be part of what we cover today. The text is from Mark 6 and verses 1 through 13. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 6. He left that place and came to his own hometown. Let me just stop right there for a second. Have you gone back to where you've grown up? Maybe it was a small town. Maybe not. I know my wife was large cities, but a small town, there's something about that imagery. You know, if you're a Hallmark fan, they always have a small town that things revolve around. But Jesus is coming to his hometown. What's it like to come back to your hometown? Full of memories, maybe you climbed the water tower in that small town. Maybe not everybody did that, but, you know, there's a memory if you did. There's things that are just a part of that hometown. And guess what? The people that are there still remember who you are. May take them a little bit. Oh, yeah. I remember you. Well, that's usually not a good beginning to that conversation. But, you know, those childhood memories, the friends that we had, are part of that hometown background. So Jesus is coming to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. And we'll talk a little bit about why. And they said, where did this man get all this? What is the wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Who is this guy? This isn't who I remember. This is someone 
when he has the same name, he looks like the same person, but who is he? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Jose and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here also, here with us? And they took offense at him. Why? Why would you take offense Then Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, among their own kin, and in their own house. Basically, they took offense is, who does this guy think he is? Who, where does he come up with this? This is not who their image of him should be. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went among the villages teaching. Jesus was on his home turf. This is where his childhood was. This is where he grew up. He knew people by name. They knew him. He was back home. And the people that he knew questioned even who he was. You would think that they would be excited to have Jesus home. Just think of maybe he built some of their furniture. I don't know. Maybe there's a lot of things that he probably, as a child, teenager growing up, interfaced in that community. But Jesus had moved on. And when I say that, if you've ever gone back to a class reunion or uh, something, uh, maybe a friend's uh, passing, And a lot of your classmates that you went to school with are there because you had that shared uh, approach. But people that have moved from that community, maybe even across the country or in other parts of the world, they don't come back the same person. Invariably, when you return to that environment, everyone kind of views each other as they were in high school, where you spent, or in my case, all of school together with friends. They're different. I'm different. Jesus was different. He was not the Jesus they remembered. They recognized their lack of change in the routine of life. In Nazareth, he wasn't in step with what he was when he left. And they didn't understand. They didn't equate to that very well. Instead, we find they were astonished. What were they astonished about? Not at his words or his works, but the very fact that Jesus was the one saying those words and doing those works. They couldn't get past the fact that Jesus, whom they knew as a child growing up, is now preaching, now saying and sharing valuable things. They couldn't put it together. It did not work for them. The town folk and Jesus' family, they knew him, his sisters, his brother, his mother, in verse 3, again, is this not, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Jose, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. What's it like to have family turn on you? Hopefully you've never experienced that. Or a friend that maybe you had very close connections with, and they, they turned. They couldn't equate this with you. The question 
in this statement, and this comes from some of the scholars, who is missing in that list? Does anybody think of who might be missing in that list? Joseph. Why wasn't Joseph mentioned? Had he already passed? Had he left? But he was not mentioned at all. Basically, this was a shot at his apparent illegitimate conception. They remember Jesus was born from Mary. They knew the story, and this was a shot at that. Basically, they were viewing him from their social class status. Evaluating people then and even today is done a great deal by the social class they're a part of. Jesus was too common. He was a common person. He came from a blue-collar background. As you think about his work as a carpenter with his stepfather, he was a laborer. He was someone that worked with his hands. We don't like being shown up by hometown folks' success. And that's when you come back to the hometown and people that have never left, they've lived there, and they're not bad folks, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you've been very successful in life, it doesn't meet with a lot of joy and, and applaud. You changed. They didn't. Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And that's where he was at. He was coming home. And that's the reception that he received. And he could do no deed of power there. They didn't buy into it. They didn't believe. They didn't trust. And they certainly didn't want to receive except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Have you been around people that it's laid out perfectly in front of them, and they can see the, the answer, and they can believe and understand it, but they go, no. And... It's hard to deal with that. It's hard to understand when someone says, I don't want to receive that, and I don't trust it. They didn't trust Jesus. We're called to receive his grace. That's what we're all, it's been offered to us, to trust and to believe his words. The lack of mighty works in his hometown was not Jesus rejecting Nazareth but Nazareth rejecting Jesus. And this is a personal question. Do you have issues with Jesus? Remember, we can't relate to him like we would a friend or a parent or a co-worker or family member. We relate differently. Do we have issues? We must take Jesus on his own terms and not to look at him through the lens of our own powerless humanity. God does awesome things through people that can be or appear to be merely ordinary, but they're not. Our job, our whole being is focused on Jesus. Trust what he is saying. Receive the grace that he gives each one of us. He called in verse 7, this is kind of the transition between the first concept and now is the second concept in those two, ver in two sections. And they do go together. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. 
He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts. Why a staff? Why, why was that the, the one and only thing they could bring? Basically, it was an adventure in faith. But to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. In other words, don't, don't bring extra clothing. Don't have a change of clothes. You've got what the clothes on your back. That's it. The sandals on your feet. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear, what what were they refusing? Back up in verse, can't find it now, but they were preaching repentance. That's what they were called out and sent out two by two. And they were refused to hear. As you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Can you see the imagery of this? Think about you as one of the 12 that was sent out with another disciple. You've got the clothes on your back. You could bring a staff, and you were going into people's homes, preaching repentance. You think everybody was all keen and hip on hearing that story? Uh Uh-uh. Some did, and they were to stay and preach that. But those that didn't, you could see people, you could see the disciples out in front, shaking the dust off. What? are the limits of what you can actually achieve in that world. What what is your achievement? So they went out and proclaimed all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This journey, this going out two by two, was a huge test of inter- personal skills. You had to really toughen that up to go into someone's home, not knowing if they're going to listen and and welcome what you're preaching or if they're going to say, get out of here. We don't want to hear that. It was a huge venture in faith. I can't imagine what that would have been like. Uh, I'm an extrovert, so I, I can readily engage people. I also don't like to be rejected by people. Only done through faith. You can't do that on your own. Comes back to the question, why a staff? Actually, I'll tell you a story about the one I don't have up here uh, first. In college, I was on a backpack trip a couple of times. We spent a month each time in Wyoming backpacking. And I had a stick that I had found. It was maybe this high. It had a big bow in it, much like my leg does. And... I walked with that stick every day up and down the mountains, fording streams, and I believe somewhere in the depth of my garage, it's still there. Uh, I carved initials of the people that were on the trip with me. It was a very near and dear item. Then. I knew that on our trip to Israel in 20, that I couldn't take my walking stick with me. The airport probably would not have looked kindly on that. So I purchased one that collapses. Took me a while to remember how to put it back together this morning. 
But I walked in Israel, and this was how I could navigate some of the terrain. It was a support. It was something to lean on as we're standing and listening to someone talk about the region. A very important and vital part of my journey was this staff that got me in places that without it, I wouldn't have tried to go. It was also the stability, effectively the third leg if you need it. So they were given the opportunity to take a staff. And in reality, it's a support for walking, to lean on when tired. And, and at the end of the day, I leaned a lot more on both of them because I was tired. But it was also a reminder to lean on something other than my own strength. So these disciples, the staff was something to remember that they weren't on their own strength. They weren't doing things on their own. We need support when we share Jesus. That's not something you do readily on your own. It's very vital that we have assistance and help. The staff represented a symbol of power. And Jesus gave the disciples authority. They were sent out with the authority of Jesus Christ. And it's not through our power, but his, that we achieve any successes. Those things that we share, the things that we trust in, are all based in Jesus. Why did Jesus tell his disciples to take nothing except a staff? Clothes on your back, no money, no debit card. When you have nothing, you are in a vulnerable position. And I would imagine that at some point in your life, you've kind of been up, up the creek, if you will, without the paddle. Exposed and more than a little bit uncomfortable. Because you don't know what's next. You don't have the facilities to deal with anything. You are really at the low. You're bare bones. And it forces us to trust in God's care and provisions and not in ourselves. And if you can remember a time that that was, who did you turn to? Hopefully it was Jesus. Hopefully that was who the one you came and asked to help. This week, basically on Friday, we got news of a family member in the hospital in Topeka. We were still there. We went by. It's a very dire situation. Young man, he's a little bit younger than I am, married to my first cousin. He has lymphoma, they've discovered, and a whole lot of other issues. We went by, we prayed. He's a pastor in his church, but he was not all coherent there. That was hard. I couldn't do any more. That was beyond my ability, but I trusted God. It wasn't, but... A little bit after we left the hospital that I found out that I have an aunt from memory care that is in a hospital in Wichita from Falls. She doesn't understand why she's there. She doesn't understand where she is. Again, we could only turn to God. That's, I can't fix it. Can't change it. And the one that was very very dear and, and hard to process. You've heard me mention the couple that we eat breakfast with on Sunday mornings. Laura got a message on Friday that they would not be there, that her husband had a heart attack. Been praying a lot for them in that situation. 
we found out this morning that they have him sedated, but hospice is becoming because he's not coming back. It was a moment in time that we shared with this couple. And the only answer is Jesus Christ. Jesus could raise him up immediately, raise my aunt, my cousin's husband. And if they pass, or if things change to the negative, it's still in God's hand. And that's what we have to be comfortable with. It's nothing that I can change. It's nothing anybody else can change. Doctors don't heal. Doctors treat. God heals. And a lot of times healing is welcome to the next life. If that's what happens, I will be sad. I will be sad for the spouse, for the siblings. But I have to stop and be really joyful. That's a world that we all ascribe to go to. We all want to get there. It was interesting, the manager of the restaurant this morning told me, he said, the next life's better, which surprised me because I never expected that from him. I said, yes, it is. When we get into those situations, it forces us to trust in God's care and provisions, not in ourselves, because I can't change anything. We will go and we will support family members if possible. That's where we're at. We have nothing to offer others except what God has already given us. And I thank God that he has poured into me his love. So when I prayed with my cousin's husband... I trusted that those were God's words, that it was God saying and reaching into this man's life. I don't think I will have an opportunity to pray with my friend from breakfast with him personally, but I believe God is working with him right now before he passes. We trust God, Jesus Christ, and we receive his grace. Share Jesus as he leads you. Trust Jesus and receive his gifts. You join me in prayer. Loving Father, as we read these scriptures, we love Jesus. We're learning how to relate to him. We're learning to trust and to receive his grace, his love. And God, as he leads us and we're asked or given the opportunity to share Jesus with anyone, friends, family, coworkers, neighbors, God, you thankfully are there. Thankfully, you are reminding us that we're not there on our own. We're there with you. And God, just as the disciples two by two were called to go out, we have some of the same opportunities. And God, I just ask that you would strengthen us, give us the words to say, and make it abundantly clear how awesome and trustworthy you are. In Jesus' name, amen.